Tonight, our theme is healing. And we have invited two speakers tonight to reflect on their understanding and their journey of healing. We know, I'm sure, having been a part of HDS, that healing is an important part of what we do. It is a sacred and holy and divine thing. For things that are broken to be put back together, for things that are silenced to be spoken aloud, for things that we once thought were dead to be brought back to life. We invite all of you to share in this conversation and to reflect through this conversation about what healing has meant to you and what it continues to mean to you. The two conversation partners that we have with us tonight, first is uh, Nancy Connors. She's an MTS 03, and she is a medical ethics consultant and a Jewish and interfaith chaplain at Hebrew Rehabilitation Center in Roslindale, Massachusetts. She serves on the Ethics Committee and the Professional Advisory Committee at Hebrew Senior Life. She's also a member of the HDS Dean's Council. So let's welcome Nancy. We also have Mel Kawakami, is that right? Good <laughs> An MDiv 74 and also a THM 87. He is the senior pastor at Newtown United Methodist Church in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. He ministered to his parish and to his local community in the wake of the horrible shootings there in December 2012. Can we welcome Mel together? Nancy and Mel, we welcome both of you. Thank you for being here, you for, for willingness to share and to reflect with us, to open up and share your stories. We're so grateful. And to begin this conversation, I'd like to ask each of you, what has your journey been from graduation day at Harvard Divinity School to today? And what could you share with us? Well, actually, since I'm old, I'm going to have to go back a little further than that because uh, I think w to, to understand w where I am and how I got there really needs to look first at the community out of which I was born. I was born in San Jose, California, in the middle of Japantown um, and grew up in an ethnic neighborhood. Uh, there was... Uh, a Methodist church on one side of the street and a Buddhist church on the other side of the street. Um, my father's family were Methodists. My mother's family was Buddhist. And so what I learned, I think, from the very beginning was a sense of tolerance and of understanding. It was out of that context that uh, I came to, to Harvard Divinity School as the first Sansei, third generation United Methodist to come to seminary. So I came bearing the weight of a community, but also the support of that community. Um, but I also came as a Japanese kid who uh, wanted to learn, but frankly didn't know how to think. And if you can bear with me for just a second, it was uh, here at Harvard that I think I learned how to think, because it came from a point of, okay, pour the information into me as though I were an empty bowl. But I remember the first class in which I was actually asked a question uh, that I stood speechless or sat speechless because the issue was not a matter of what I knew. It's what I thought about it. So if I came away with a gift, uh, it, was, it was that. It, was the, um, it taught me some intellectual tools it taught me how to think. I think it also, uh, one of the sadnesses for me coming back now, five years later, <laughs> is that these were residences when I was here. And so much of the learning and the interaction came through hanging out with each other. And what I learned there was a real sense, of value of, for diversity, and a value um, of, of just 
being able to think together. There's also, uh, uh, because I got to rub up against so many other different kinds of traditions, um, I ended up valuing much more my United Methodist background. Hmm. Uh, because one of the contexts was having to talk about what I right. believed in. And so that really strengthened who I was as a Methodist and my identity there. And then I think another part of this was my sense of call. And like so many biblical characters, it was always, no, not me. And I spent a long time running away from this. But in the running away, was given some gifts. One of them was from um, uh, one of them was from Jim Fowler, who taught me about faith development. I think I learned much about counseling and education at the Ed School. I actually worked at the Bureau of Study Council for a few years, and then went from there to uh, run a pastoral counseling center which in the sea change of um, health care, I also had to close down. So I do grief. Um, and then from there on into pastoral ministry. Uh, so I served several parishes, including one in Simsbury, and the last seven years uh, in Newtown, which is a church of about six or 700. 250 on a worshiping Sunday. So that's what brought me uh, to Newtown. Boy. So much of what you said rings true for mm. me too. That sense of um, really learning how to appreciate your own tradition by bumping up against and joining with others. My name is Nancy, as you know, I'm Jewish, and because I'm old too, I get to start before I do school graduation. Um, my, uh, in the spirit of being candid, um, my interest in religion really didn't originate in my household. We were pretty reform and unobservant, but it was after my brother's suicide that uh, I found myself finding um, comfort in the grieving, Jewish grieving rituals and the structure and the way they helped him in the chaos. And uh, that, that was when I was 30. And uh, so I, meantime, was an art director for a magazine published by MIT called Technology Review. And one day we were all fired, um, which is really good <laughs> if you have to get fired because uh, you know, you don't feel like, well, we all got fired, right? It's not me. <laughs> so I immediately went online and applied and got in and had, were just the best years, best years for so many of the reasons you mentioned. I um, had, though, I guess there are some folks here who expressed that they would be interested in sort of the medical ethics theme. I had been uh, along during my journey. Um, at uh, the Div School, I had to make some or work with my brother on making some healthcare decisions at the end of life, my father's life, and then during the, my mother's life. And uh, they were so fraught. They were so fraught. It was so hard to know what was the right thing to do. And there was no one to talk about to talk about what these the implications of these decisions. The clinicians just weren't there then. I believe there's a lot of progress in that regard. But so I found myself hungry just to often just to unpack my own, my own uh, experience and then hopefully be helpful. I'm kind of drawn like a moth to those times generally in the ICU it's not clear that the person won't survive. It, it, it's not clear. And, and you're just on that cusp. And it's so hard. And this, all those issues about sanctity of life and what, is, what, what does a, a good daughter do? What does a good son do? And anyway, so I find myself uh, in my chaplaining and in my uh, work in these other institutions really drawn to 
the patient's perspective. So afterward, I was lucky enough after Harvard uh, to uh, go get a fellowship in medical ethics at the medical school. I think as a uh, uh, religionist, I was kind of like spice, you know, <laughs> to sort of break up the monotony of all those clinicians. And, uh, um, and that, again, was just a wonderful opportunity. And they go have ongoing educational uh, consortia because that's the way you kind of build and cultivate values, is this by huddling over these complex questions and de question, you know, debating it amongst yourselves. So that's a, uh, uh, an ongoing learning experience, thanks to Harvard, uh, HDS. And then, of course, to be a chaplain, I'm certain, well, I know I have some colleagues here who have gone through clinical pastoral education. Am I the only, has anyone else done CPE? Yay! Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. In order to be licensed, you go through four of these units, and it's um, 200. Each unit is 200 hours of clinical time and 200 hours of classroom, and you know. So, so it's been a long educational path, but still on it, running hard. Mel and Nancy, tonight we're focusing on healing. And I'm wondering what healing means to you, both personally and in your vocation. Wow. <laughs> I think that's a huge question. Um, and of course, when I, I think about healing, I think first about brokenness. Uh, on the morning of December 12, 2012, uh, I was actually in, in another town. I was 45 minutes away. I was at a doctor's appointment. And as I emerged from the doctor's appointment, I realized that I had 20 calls on my phone. Wow, wow. So I knew something was up. And I started going through. And the first one was from my secretary who said, there's been a shooting. I got in my car, drove straight to Newtown, um, and was listening to the radio on the way. And of course, the radio had no information whatsoever, or wrong information. There were two shooters. Nobody was hurt. A couple of people were hurt. But it was only until I arrived at Newtown that I, that I heard that there were children involved. And by the time I walked from the, the uh, church to the school, all of the happy reunions had already happened. That is, all the children who had survived uh, were reunited. What was the sad part was that I arrived for the families for whom the governor then stepped forward and said, there are no children, there are no more children who are going to come out. Um, and there are adults who've been uh, killed. That broke the community. You were talking about the Frost poem before. The package just dropped. Um, there is n no way to describe the pain that was uh, there in the community at that moment. There is no way to describe the brokenness in all of us. Um, Sandy Hook is a smaller community, and the church really is at the heart of Sandy Hook. So not only did we have children and families, but also school teachers, school administrators, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, teachers' aides, all were affected. And if you, didn't, if you didn't know anyone, you knew somebody who did know someone. And so it was out of that context of total brokenness and the darkness. This was December. Um, it was getting dark very early. And it seemed as though the darkness would take over. Here's one of the stories of healing. In the midst of that, 
a state trooper pulls up to uh, our church. And he's got a bucket in the back of his car. And he said, I just drove from the airport and I've got this light. Do you guys want it? This is December 22nd, so it was 10 days after the shooting. He said, this comes from the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Wow. It is a, a light. Wow. So we had a candle that came from the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem on the darkest day of the year to remind us that there is a light. And that candle stood on our altar um, until Epiphany and really was a statement of hope and really showed us that even in the midst of that darkness, there was still hope. And that, I think, became a, a kind of image that helped us get through. I think um, healing itself has been a, a kind of balance between uh, memory and hope. And those two things have been supported in faith. As I was talking about the things that have contributed to my trajectory, I think that the interfaith community, for example, work together in the midst of that great darkness to remember the light. And that included um, all kinds of faiths. The Baha'is were active. Mm. The Muslim community was active. The Jewish community was very active. And then the Christian community gathered together uh, in an interfaith way. Um, so that there was that kind of cooperation, which really helped a community make it through what, uh, what was a very dark time. I think, too, that there was that sense of um, <clears throat> that we were willing to work together. And so questions like, why would God do something like this, became active points of discussion in a community that otherwise was you know, a, a very normal middle class suburban community, struck by a, a true disaster and a true tragedy. So we had to ask questions like, why would this happen? Why would God do this? Or why would God allow this? What's evil in the world? And, and why us? So those kinds of questions became the context in which faith and hope really played out. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. So I, I'm going to talk about my work in long-term care with the elderly and demented individuals. And as he was speaking, I'm realizing it's just the opposite. I mean, everything that happened to you is against the laws of nature. Everything that happens where I work is really quite compatible with the laws of nature. And yet, still, nobody wants to die. So just get that straight. It's not. And so often, when you talk to me about healing, I often feel that I'm the one who's gotten healed because I didn't want to work with these folks. I, um, I was afraid. I'm afraid of my own pending death. I want to make the most out of my life. Um, I, you talked about hope. Nobody goes home. Nobody gets better mm -hmm. from being old. Nobody goes home, this is their final home, or they go to their eternal home. You know, what are, they, what are they hoping for? And at least from where I sat as an outsider looking in, it looked to me as if they'd outlived their lives. And so, so what, what was healing going to look like for them? And that's what they've taught me. So the stories I have today are just going to be where they taught me. Uh, 
how to heal. And so often, and I just throw this in for the medical ethics and folks who are interested, often healing is discussed in these medical settings or quasi-medical settings as, um, as not contrasted to, but alongside curing. And so folks can't be cured of old age, as we've said. And in hospital settings, you know, they'll often talk about how you can heal when you can't be cured. Okay, so that's, that's the challenge. That's the assignment. Okay, um, my first uh, story that taught me so much, I... Um, there was a, there's a big common room, there always is, and um, there was a gentleman there who had his... I don't want to interfere with my mic, but his chin was pressed against his chest. His, his neck was frozen, so he was always looking down. And he could speak. He was very fragile. He had no visitors, I'd learned. And he was sort of this way always. And he could speak. But I could see, you know, he would try to look up at me. And if you try to do that, you see how it hurts your eyes. So, you know, I tried to speak, and at some point it just occurred to me I had to see him if I was going to be with him. So I got on the floor, and that wasn't enough. So I had to get scooch over, right, <laughs> to get underneath his wheelchair, his legs, <laughs> sort of like this. <laughs> and I um, finally get underneath, and in the right position, I look up, and I see the biggest smile I have ever seen. In my, it's like his face was like the moon. It was so bright. And of course, I sort of go, well, there you are. <laughs> I found you, and sort of you know, made a lot of noise. And everyone noticed, of course, because you know, I'm not Fumbolina, and I'm on the floor. And, uh, <laughs> Everyone's laughing. Everyone's laughing. So, yeah, it can happen. You know, you can laugh. It's, uh, speaking of Thumbelina, I often realize, though, yeah, we laughed, but it was for such a short time. And it was so little. I didn't fix his neck. I didn't make it so anyone's going to visit him more often. I was just there for then. And, and for a long time in my not being healed, I would say, you know, what am I accomplishing? Who, so I would, I um, have this little image of a, th um, a thimble that I keep with me, and it's, it's all I can offer. I can, it's what I offer fits in a thimble, and that's all. That's all. Here it is. That's all. It's okay. It was that. It wasn't zero. It was that. So they healed me in that, and I often have, I find in my tradition, language that will heal me, hold me as I'm trying to do this stuff. Uh, one is you don't have to complete the project, but you have to start it. So that's where having a thimble gets me off the hook. Um, I also hold in my heart this saying from uh, Rachel Remen. Um, she's a physician. She's a philosopher. She's written a lot. Anyway, this little prayer, may I trust that the way you have made me is the way that is needed. That gets me over the ever-present feelings of incompetence. So, my next story of healing is uh, going down the hall, and one of my buddies is in his wheelchair being pushed by a son and his daughter-in-law. And, uh, you know, I'm waving. He's not waving back. And so I, you know, do my thing where I try to get into his line of vision, and I do get his attention, and I get a little smile, and I get a wave. But I can see, and you learn to recognize, you know, it takes a lot of, it, it, there's a time when it's, too hard to come to the surface. It's too hard. And so I saw him go back under, and that was OK. And years later, years later, I see his son. And he recognizes me. And he says hello and, and expresses that that interaction had been the last time his father had interacted with a, another person and uh, how much it had meant to him. 
So I just, I, again, I, I think I was healed, or I guess the family. I guess what we have to say to ourselves is those little moments heal our families and that they knew someone cared. So my next healing, we're, we're, I, I would, we, we, there, in my CPE training, I'll try to stop stuttering, we've had recently a lot of training around um, alternative lifestyles, the LG, um, I always get my initials wrong, bear with me, the gay communities have really been helpful in reminding us that there are lots of ways to be in love and how can we help and support. And I, um, and I had an experience with um, one of our residents where clearly she just needed to be held. She just needed to be held, and it was such a normal. So, and of course, in this setting, you can't always be held. And I, was, I won't go into the specifics, but I was so grateful that my training, that our society has moved in this direction, mm -hmm. to it, that I felt enabled and free to hold her in a way that was appropriate, in a way that didn't embarrass, in a way that didn't push her humanity aside. So that would be a, again, I've both healing. And then my final one is a story which I only sort of dare, I'm kind of scared that it's being taped because I only really dare tell a div school audience this. <laughs> um, I had a one woman and you know most, many folks can't speak or if they can speak they can't remember. So asking them questions like, what's your name? They can't answer. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to embarrass them. They, they, you know, their, their sense of dignity is still there. But their capacity to hold on to it is often impaired. So um, there was one woman. I would come in. I would sing blessings. And I would try to connect with her. And she would very articulately, without using words, <laughs> Tell me, all right, go. Um, after, and this is a, a good part about long-term care is contrasted to hospital care, which is often high turnover. I keep coming back. So I noticed that after a few weeks, she would do this in time with the music. Again, music, when you can't use words, often music is an access point. And often these prayers and blessings, I would imagine hymns from the past, are still able to be recalled. So that's another wonderful way to connect. Anyway, one day I walk in and she raises her arms to me, open arms, and I rush to her arms. And I realize that she has triggered in me the same sort of tenderness I would feel toward a baby, you know, just like a baby. And I, you know, you try to be mindful of the way you're interacting to keep it right, the CPE. <laughs> um, and so we would end up just looking at each other. That was the way. And I often wondered what it looked like to others. But for us, it was fine. One day I came and was told she was dying. And I went to her room. And she greeted me this way, and I ran to her, and, but she was mouthing something to me. She was saying, my baby, my baby, to me. And I'm thinking, whoa, I thought you were my baby, <laughs> and I'm your baby. <laughs> I'm thinking, how cool that we found this kind of mutual way to connect, and... Um, and this, I, I looked at her, and I, I can only tell you, it was the most beautiful face I have ever seen in my life. And she, I kept saying to myself, how, how did I not notice? How did I not notice what a ravishing beauty she is? And uh, I was spellbound, and then the sun came in. <laughs> the spell was broken, but I, I keep remembering that moment, which was, of course, our last moments together. And um, 
You know, I, I keep believing there's something to that Martin Buber stuff of the I-thou relationship, and it's as close to a vision as I've ever gotten, and it was probably one of the most, no, the most powerful moments of my life. So I'm sure that you guys have stories, too, I'm eager to hear. One, one more uh, question for you both. How has the theology or foundation from Harvard Divinity School influenced your understanding and your work in healing and ways that maybe you've been called to be responsible with theology in such tender times, especially I'm thinking of you, Mel. Maybe you can start. Do I always have to? <laughs> <laughs> um. I think, well, you mentioned Buber. Uh, he was one of the people that I met here in terms of the writing and in terms of the relational aspect. When we see uh, the I-Thou uh, working out in the world, uh, this week uh, was the 26th playground dedicated to the victims of Sandy Hook. And it wasn't necessarily the playgrounds themselves but it was the people who got together in the moment, having relationships, right. grieving together at times, but also celebrating together an accomplishment, and then having all of these children come to the playground mm -hmm. is immensely healing, and it was relational. That's where it started. Um, I think, too, I, I mentioned Fowler before, Jim Fowler, S seeing that people are coming to faith in different ways and at different places and different stages, if you want to use his language, but it also gives us a way of relating even better. Um, I remember uh, Gordon Kaufman's book, The Problem of God, which he talks about the theodicy. Forty years ago when I read the book, I was thinking, okay, <laughs> I'm not even sure I understand it. <laughs> but boy, 40 years later, I had to live it out. And so that discussion became a, a foundation for looking at how do we begin to understand the impact of evil in the world. Um, so I think that's th those are some of the ways that I... Um, carried out the Harvard tradition in my own life. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think I really learned tolerance. I thought I was tolerant before, but I really learned it here. Um, I think I was carrying around a lot of uh, baggage as a Jew, sort of anticipating anti-Semitism, feeling folks really didn't want me around. I looked for it here, but I couldn't find <laughs> This is a very loving community, and um, I learned a lot from that. I have to say, I also, you know, there's this funny thing. It's, you can't hate someone you've, learned, you've studied with. You know, you can't. You just, it, you just, you can't. When you're in the exchanging ideas and really testing out, what matters. Um, so I have found too often folks are ready to find refuge in fear and hatred of the other. And I really learned how not to do that here. And I miss that. I miss it. Thank you both. Those are the questions that I wanted to ask Mel and Nancy, but I'd like to invite all of you now to share any questions or reflections with these two guests that we have with us. And we have a microphone to pass to you if you'd like to ask Mel or Nancy or both a question. What questions do you have? We don't, so please just speak up. And I'd be willing to share. I will repeat the question as I hear it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, I have a question, and it's about um, closure. You talked about 
um, going through that process, we talked about loss and seeing that there's light or healing. What does, especially in the face of the unbearable, what does closure look like? And, and, and what's the day after like? Mm. I, I want to be able to say there is no such thing as closure. As long as we have memory, um, closure, uh, I, I'm not sure there is such a thing as closure. I'll give you an example. Uh, a week before the tragedy, we had a gift exchange at the church. And I'm taking pictures. And there's little Chase Kowalski. Now, that, that's a valuable picture to me. Um, it's one that I will treasure forever because it was a very candid moment. It was a joyful moment. And a week later, he was gone. I'm not sure what closure would look like uh, with Chase or with any of the other children. And in fact, it is that legacy that, that is part of the ongoing um, tradition, if you want to say, now. We've got Ben's Lighthouse. Ben loved lighthouses. And Ben's Lighthouse is sending out groups to places like Moore, Oklahoma. Um, we've got uh, our own foundation from Chase Kowalski is the Run for Chase. He loved to run. He was everywhere, which is why he was in a lot of my pictures. Um, and so uh, they sponsor runs for children. They're, uh, they're building a, an animal uh, uh, refuge uh, on town land uh, for another one of the children. So each one has their own legacy. And so I'm not sure what closure looks like, I guess is what I'm ending up saying. Um, so I'm not answering your question. <laughs> Can I take a stab? Sure, absolutely. So I wouldn't say, I, I so agree with you, especially for survivors, that closure. But it's often blended with forgiveness. So that's often a task that has to be accomplished before you can feel at peace, if closure means being at peace. So forgiveness, uh, and there's literature on that. And it's harder when the person you have to forgive is dead already, you know? So, um, so as we talked a little earlier, I mean, I, I, how do you forgive? And anyway, so, um, um, we also have in our traditions, you see, I sort of cling to these language, but we have this expression, may his memory be for a blessing. You say that too. And you always wonder, why do they say the floor? Why don't you just say, may his memory be a blessing? But I think it is perhaps suggesting that the, um, our memories are for something. You're supposed to use them. <laughs> use those memories. Conjure it up. Because you, 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 I'm sure you've seen this. When you remember, you see they are brought back. They are brought back in a form, mm -hmm. but whether you stop missing them. Mm. Uh, this is a question for Mel uh, because of your circumstance and your experience. And I kind of think of you as a first responder. Um, and then how, did you, how have you found healing given the tragedy that you had to deal with? And, and how do you remain hopeful and, you know, in the pulpit the next Sunday. How do you go forward? There were a number of things that helped move forward. Um, one was the institutional response, the denominational response was fabulous. Um, I had never faced a flood of cameras before. I, I didn't know what to do. Um, and so we got a, someone from United Methodist Communications to come in and help. Um, I didn't know what to do in the face of a human-caused mass disaster. So we had the United Methodist uh, Committee on Relief come in and consulted with us. In fact, she was from uh, Oklahoma City 
uh, from the bombing there. And she helped guide us through that. Uh, the American Association of Pastoral Counselors sent someone down to do a critical incident debrief with our staff. The Presbyterians sent uh, another group to debrief all of us as an interfaith group. And then finally, I think simply because of what I would call secondary trauma, that is just hearing the story after story after story, um, I got myself into therapy. So there was a connection that I had uh, that I could talk to um, that was not connected with the disaster um, just to help put those things together with, with me. And then finally, there were a group of people that, about which I talked about issues of faith. So there was a supportive faith group um, because there were a lot of faith issues coming up. So not having to bear that alone was part of the path to personal healing. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, with the memory of the Connecticut uh, incident and the mitigative uh, measures taken uh, that led to the closure of the school before reopening, uh, would you say the reopening process and these mitigative measures were adequate for a therapeutic kind of intervention in your context uh, to really enhance closure and uh, bring healing? Mm. Mm. One of the things that's happened in Newtown, and I commend our first select woman um, and the process, the Board of Education, um, they have tried to be as transparent as possible. And so the planning, rebuilding process, the, even the clearing of the ground has been very thoughtful and consultative all, all the way. Um, oftentimes in clergy groups or interfaith groups, you're on the outside and you're lucky if they uh, ask you anything. Uh, but in this process, we, we've considered ourselves an integral part of the process. Um, so for example, we had quite literally tractor trailer loads of snowflakes and teddy bears and things that Gracious people throughout the world were kind enough to send. What do we do with them? Um, so uh, it may sound kind of horrifying now, but we that we ground them up, and they're going to become part of the foundation of the new Sandy Hook School. That was an idea that came from the community, in part because they were willing to ask the question. So because of the transparency, I think people have felt like they're participating in how things proceed. D did that answer your question? Oh, there's one question back here that's been, you, yes. I would like to ask both of you how faith <coughs> how people of faith were able to facilitate changes in the communities that we serve to make the physical conditions under which people were suffering any easier, safer, less painful. In the case of Hebrew rehab, it's what can be done to provide more stimulation for elders who may still have plenty of memory inside them, but no, no one except an occasional chaplain to bring it out. In the case of Newtown, where I talked to a lifelong friend of mine who lives in Sandy Hook, and whose son went to high school with the older brother of the shooter, I found out that he is constantly having his peace at home disturbed by target practice, rifle shooting, coming from the next door neighbor because Connecticut does not control arms at home. One of the basic issues in Newtown was that this woman knew how to shoot, had a permit for guns, 
taught the boy how to shoot, and then he killed her along with all those children and so on. And in spite of the pressure and the years that have intervened, there are still no changes in the gun laws, not there, not here. How have the ministers, chaplains, and people of faith exerted pressure to make those values change the physical conditions of justice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, in the state of Connecticut, things have changed. Um, through uh, a coalition called the Newtown Action Alliance, together with the Clergy Association and the Interfaith Council, uh, we actually initiated uh, changes in Connecticut law that uh, prohibits, uh, uh, or limits the size of magazines, uh, limits the automatic capacity of, of rifles, and actually bans certain so-called assault weapons. So we were quickly successful in, um, in Connecticut. And there was a, a fairly large coalition that then went to Washington. We thought we could get something done in Washington. And well, we, we all know Congress. <laughs> and Congress acted like Congress. And nothing got done. Uh, so the regrouping has been around universal background checks. And I think what you'll start to see is an initiative in that direction. Uh, but something interesting has happened, particularly around um, a coalition growing around gun violence. Uh, at the first anniversary, we gathered at the National Cathedral, and we also spoke to uh, Congress about that anniversary and about what it meant in terms of acting, uh, doing something positive uh, in terms of gun violence. So I think what, what many of us have done has have turned the pain into a promise of action. And it may have gone underground in the sense of we don't get the visibility, uh, of course, that we, we had back then. But I can promise you that that's still ongoing. Um, well, it sounds like we haven't done our job for someone you love. And I hope you'll give me his or her name, and maybe I can make things a little better. Um, but you're absolutely right. You know, there's not sufficient coverage ever. I guess in the old days when grandma was kept home, she could just sort of be parked in the kitchen and people ran in front of her. But these days we have this system. We do our best. We try, I guess inadequately in your case, and I'm sorry, to... It wasn't a personal question. Ah, okay, good. Well, then maybe we aren't doing so bad. What what made you say? <laughs> no, I didn't. My both parents and beloved partner. I've done deathbeds in the AIDS epidemic. Mm. I see what goes on in these institutions, mm. and I have written instructions that I am never to be put in one. Mm. And I am huh. concerned about the conditions under which people who are frail and ailing are warehoused, and I think that if faith leaders don't take a stand on it, who's going to? Because it serves the system to charge the insurers. Here, here. I mean, I, and uh, so I, I do have to say, though, that I wonder if you came recently if you would have the same experience. I'm not so sure. Maybe. And I'd be interested. I would invite you because I, I have the feeling that I'm part of this uh, boomer generation that, you know, wants to take better care of our elders and is outraged when we see it. But, I, but your point is, you know, are we ever doing enough for all kinds of people? We have time for one more question and I see there's many questions to be asked. There will be 
further opportunity for this dialogue as we go move into the reception. But one more question here, and oh gosh, <laughs> come on. Forgive me. We'll go right here in the front. Um, and since, uh, so we, those of you students here, so we're all first year students, and kind of wrestling with healing, and, um, you know, what, what what to do. What is your what are some things that you could share with us about what you've learned not to do? Okay, I could keep you here so long. <laughs> yeah. um, the hardest thing for me was to get it out of my system that I could fix something. I just can't. So every time you try to, you know, be an adjunct nurse or an adjunct, you know, you're just going to get yourself in trouble. So stick to your roles and just have faith in the power of presence. Have faith that your willingness to offer a, an authentic relationship will work. Oh, that's, how's that? Can, can that get me off the hook? All right, whoa. Uh, from Stephen Ministry, we have a saying that says um, that you're the caregiver, but God is the cure giver. Mm. And if you don't mix the two up, that's a good place to start. Um, and a ministry of presence is what helps you do that. If you're there to hear their understanding and the way they put together the world, you're also going to be present for some incredible incredible stories, stories of hurt, pain, but also of healing, of hope. And the only way you're going to get that is to listen and to be present and to help facilitate that kind of um, dialogue. I'll say something really woo-woo here, see if I get into I, I'll even say... I, I actually feel transcendence helping me. Is that too? Do, yeah. I actually feel that you're not alone there. You're not alone there. You're, you're, you're operating on all kinds of wavelengths. And just relax, believe, relax into it. Ugh. I don't know. No, I'm sorry I said that. <laughs> it, it, it was a, a statement about the power of prayer to walk into a room and say, I'm sorry, your, your child is not coming back. If the yeah. Holy Spirit wasn't there with me, the, the way I felt, um, I'm not sure I could have ever done that. So. Thanks. Thank you all so much for being here. In closing, just a reflection. Some of us began in the labyrinth before coming into this room tonight and we centered ourselves around stories of healing and I'd like to go back to the words that were shared in that labyrinth and invite all of us to remember that the ways that we framed healing in the labyrinth have come to life here. These, these dialogues tonight were focused around stories of healing. Healing being when Things that are broken, like a community ravished by a shooting disaster, are put back together in the form of ground-up snowflakes and teddy bears that build a foundation for new beginnings. Healing is a time when things that were once dark can be brought back to light, like a light brought from Bethlehem ten days after the shooting. Healing is a time when that which is hurt finds relief, like a head pressed down to a chest, unable to look up, to make connections, to have a dialogue, and then a chaplain on her knees making eye contact. Healing is things that were unspoken and secret declared out loud, like arms raised up high and lips mouthing 
my baby, my baby. Healing is things that were buried becoming uncovered, like a journey back to discovering the ancient Jewish grieving rituals in the time that it mattered. Healing is things that we once thought were dead or put in the tomb being brought back to life. In other words, that a memory would be for a blessing. Tonight, we invite all of you to go out of this place remembering and reflecting on what healing means to you, on where healing needs to come about for you in a way that you can bring healing into the world. Nancy and Mel, we thank you so much for your time with us tonight. Can we thank them? Thank you. Thank you.